Well, good morning, everyone. Today is a delightful day to be at Broadway Baptist Church. All right, a lot of good things have been happening here recently, and a lot of good things are coming up this next week or so. I want to welcome you. We have some guests. We're glad that you're here, and we're glad that everyone's here today. Um, you remember last Sunday, we weren't here because of the power of being out. And last Sunday was a special Sunday in a way in that I was going to be gone initially, then I wasn't gone, but uh, S Steve Moscow, who had planned the wonderful service for last Sunday in my absence, uh, that didn't happen. So today, we're going to sort of play musical chairs. I'm going to play the organ, Stephen is going to direct, and now Cade, who normally plays the piano, uh, he has a temperature, his muscles all hurt, and he's dizzy. So he didn't come today. We want to keep Cade, he probably has COVID, that'd be my guess, but who knows. But anyway, Cade will not be here today. And Betty's going to play timpani, and then we're going to swap, and she's going to play the organ, and I'll play the piano. So it's going to be kind of fun to watch what goes on today. Uh, but I hope that you'll worship by singing and by giving Stephen your undivided attention as he leads worship. And I'm going to turn the service over to Steve Moscow. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning. Good morning. It is a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord, and his name is a name above all others. Would you stand as we sing all hail the power of Jesus' name? <laughs>
so much to be uh, grateful for. Lord, uh, we just thank you today for this church, Lord. We thank you for these people that have gathered. Lord, be with Pastor Daniel as he gives his sermon, Lord. Lord we just thank you for all of our blessings, Lord. Everything we have belongs to you. And uh, pray that uh, you will be with us this morning. Let your Holy Spirit uh, flow into this building, Lord. We thank you for today. Amen.
Carol, Jackie, thank you so much. Wonderful song there, The Old Rugged Cross. That is a true classic. I appreciate that wonderful music. Before our children go downstairs to Children's Church, I want to have a special time of prayer for several things. Next week, we start revival here at our church. Um, we have a guest preacher. He's from Rock Castle County. His name is Randy McFerrin. He's a motorcycle guy. He's going to be here Sunday morning through Wednesday night. And we have dinner for you. Now, this is next week. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night, we have dinner. So you have opportunity this week to invite people to church, uh, be praying for people to come to revival, be praying for folks to be saved. Uh, Randy is, um, he serves as the associational uh, mission, uh, the director of their uh, association there, and he's also our current president of the Kentucky Baptist Convention. So he is just a true blessing, uh, what he's going to be here at Broadway. So um, I know you'll be excited about that, but uh, a lot of that is our preparation. We're looking for people this week to invite. We have our little invite cards. You want to pick some of these up this week, and it has a schedule in the back to invite people to church. And we're also, I'm going to have a special time of prayer here. We're praying for our 40 days of outreach, which is our prayer guide we're going through. Um, also, this coming Friday is our 24-hour day of prayer. If you want a time slot, you just need to let me know. And I'll help you find a good time for you. I mean, around the clock, people are praying for that. And um, also, we want to be praying, because a lot of people have been talking to me, that Asheville, North Carolina, has been devastated by Hurricane Helene. And um, it's just, uh, they have a long, long road to recovery there from the devastation. So um, many of you have been have family, you know this area very familiar, there that I-40 uh, area. So we're going to pray for our revival. We're going to pray for Randy McFerrin as he preaches next week in the next four days. And then on that, you know, that Wednesday night, we have baptism for folks to get baptized. And then we're also going to pray for the recovery efforts there of Hurricane Helene, because that's our Kentucky... Baptist Disaster Relief is there right now working, and uh, just, just as you know, it's immense work. So why don't we go and have our special time of prayer as we pray for all of these things. God, we thank you for the opportunity as a church family to be able to pray for all the needs around us. And Lord, we especially pray for the people in Asheville, North Carolina, and those communities that are just, just devastated by this hurricane. Lord, we just pray for the um, Baptist disaster relief workers. We pray for water and just electricity and for uh, homes. Is all, all of these things have to be put back together. And Lord, we just lift up those communities and we pray for the gospel to advance. We pray for the churches that will be uh, united as it has affected literally hundreds of churches in those communities. And Lord, we just pray for a revival to come out of that um, uh, the, this, the recovery efforts. Lord, we pray for our revival next week. We pray for evangelist Randy McFerrin. Lord, I just lift him up. I pray that you give him the words to say. I pray this week, our church, we are praying for our revival. We're looking for opportunities to invite people, and we're anticipating you to move. Lord, we know that if we are uh, faithful in uh, prayer and in uh, personal evangelism, Lord, that you bring fruit from that. Lord, we just pray as we go through our prayer, God, as we're today, we're praying specifically for Randy, and we lift him up. Lord, we just pray for the many needs here in our community. Lord, we pray for those in our church community who are dealing with pain and suffering. And Lord, I just pray for your spirit to move in this worship service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for that. I want to encourage our children at this time. It is opportunity to go to children's church so miss sarah rios is teaching children's church if you're a little one and you want to go to children's church at this time you'll want to stand up and we are going to follow miss sarah to children's church and then head straight to sunday school after that you want to open up your bible to the book of jonah jonah chapter 1 verse 17 if you don't know where jonah is it's after the book of obadiah if that helps so an old testament there so jonah chapter 1 this is a message here on um, answered prayer. In Jonah, um, I'm actually going to read what Jesus says about Jonah. Jonah is one, I think if we could illustrate what's going on here. God called Jonah. He told him to do something. And he said, go. And Jonah answered God's call with no. 
And then God responded to Jonah's no with woe. And that's what we're about to see here, the big woe and what occurred when Jonah decided he was going to disobey and run from God. And many times in our life, we find ourselves just like Jonah because God, we know God, what God has told us to do, and for whatever reason, there's a lot of different reasons we don't obey the Lord. But what's really odd about this book, this book is only four chapters long, and it's a powerful story, twofold, because you see how in many ways weak Jonah is, how he, he just doesn't want to see people saved. He does not want the Ninevites to repent. That's what the latter part of the book, he actually gets angry with God because the people turned, um, turned to the Lord. He did not want that. And then the second reason we need to know this book is because Jesus spoke about this book quite a bit. He actually said this is the, this is the book that gives us a sign. So that's what I'm going to read what Jesus said. Before we read Jonah 1, I want to read to you what Jesus says about Jonah. This is out of Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. A lot of people want a sign. He answered them, An evil and adulterous generation demands a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of a huge fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at Jonah's preaching. And look, something greater than Jonah is here. So Jesus says this, the story of Jonah is actually a sign for us. It's a sign that he, Jesus was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, just like we're going to see Jonah here in the story we're going to read. And not only that, the people of Nineveh, they actually obeyed what Jonah preached, and they repented. And Jesus says the people of Nineveh, and that was a wicked city, they are more righteous than people of Jesus' time and people today who refuse to repent. So the story here of Jonah is one where Jonah is commanded to go, and he goes the opposite way. He's the wrong way prophet. And what occurs here is he's running from the Lord. And what's interesting about this is he actually, in verse 10, I'm in one, chapter 1, verse 10, Jonah tells the people, he's boarding this ship, he's telling the other sailors, I'm running from the Lord. Now, if, if you meet someone and they're telling you they're running from the Lord, that, that means they're, just, they're living in disobedience right there. And you know good things aren't going to happen. And many times when we're running from the Lord, when we're not obedient to what God says, it's like we're carrying a weight with us. This here is a 20-pound weight. Could you just imagine just walking around everywhere you go and you're carrying this weight? That is what this looks like when you're going the opposite way, when you just aren't obeying the Lord. You're carrying an unnecessary weight that is slowing you down, and not only that, it just gets old, and it just never gets better, and you don't, it just, so you're just carrying this weight, and it just gets tiresome, it's just a burden, and you're just weighted down, and you're just exhausted, that's, look at verse 10, 110, the men were seized by a great fear, so this is a storm has broken out, obviously, on the boat, and the men said to him, what have you done? The men knew he was fleeing from the Lord's presence because he had told them. The man boards a boat and says, I'm going to, here's my ticket. Just won't y'all know, I am running from the Lord. As if he's like happy about it. And the guys are like, all right, well, welcome aboard the boat. We're going to go sailing. So uh, as you run from the Lord, so they know something isn't right. This man is carrying this weight on the boat. So Jonah knows this storm is because of him. He knows it's because of him. And a lot of times for us, when we are in the midst of a storm, or we are uh, in a challenging situation, if, and a lot of times it's just you and the Lord that know this, it's because you're disobedient. A lot of times we're not like Jonah. We don't tell people we're running from the Lord. We don't tell people about our sins. God knows, but we're not, we're keeping it between us and the Lord. But Jonah here, he 
he told them that he was doing this, and he accepts the blame in verse 12. So they, the men didn't want to kill the guy because, I mean, they're in the Mediterranean Sea. It's a massive storm. The boat's actually breaking apart. I mean, it's a terrible situation. And in verse 13, the, the sailors, because Jonah had paid his fare, so he deserved, I guess, a, a, a ride on the, on the boat. And now he's saying, just throw me over. It, all this is because of me. But they recognized they had to do something because they're all going to die if they don't throw Jonah over. So, um, they actually, in verse 14, these sailors, they don't want Jonah's blood on their hands. Uh, they don't want to be charged for their innocent life. So, it says in verse 10, 15, they picked him up and they threw him over. And immediately, the sea stopped. I mean, the winds just stopped the moment Jonah hit the water. And in verse 16, it says, the men were seized by great fear of the Lord. I mean, they are fearful because they were in this massive storm and now it's a bright, sunny day. No problem. And there goes Jonah. We just threw one of our guys over. And they know this is, it's over for him. And it says here, it's amazing. These, these sailors, these sailors likely aren't believers. These men here made a sacrifice to the Lord. And what they're afraid of, they, they've totally missed it. They're afraid God's going to kill them for killing this man. And now it says they're making vows and a sacrifice on the boat right there. But God's not really concerned about those other sailors. God's concerned about Jonah's obedience. And that's where we're going to pick up here in verse 17. So Jonah falls into the water. And he knows that this is probably it. And what the story of the book of Jonah, what's amazing about this story, it's actually not so much about a great fish or a well. And by the way, if you, if you study what type of fish it was, most Bible scholars and people, and the type of fish that live in the Mediterranean, this was a sperm well. And because they have very large um, uh, bellies, it would be possible. And they have actually swallowed scuba divers before for someone. Now, this is also a miracle as well. For someone, because whales, as you know, have oxygen, to get a human being inside of a sperm well and somehow lodge its head up into the uh, lung cavity of a well to keep Jonah alive. Now, also, this is a miracle, so the Lord could have obviously easily provided oxygen inside the well and kept Jonah alive but most uh, you look at what type of fish this was I, I would say it's a sperm well is what happened here so Jonah is finding about to find himself in a situation that he realizes only the Lord is pursuing him at this point because the whole story of these four chapters of the book of Jonah is God's pursuit of Jonah that's God is the actual uh, hero of this whole story Jonah is a pitiful, reluctant prophet. I mean, the man doesn't want to obey God. And then he's mad at the people who got saved. He, doesn't even want to, he wanted to actually see the people of Nineveh die apart from the Lord. He wanted them to die in their sins. He did not want them to repent. So of all the people whom Jesus selected, I mean, there, there has to be a reason why and the, he's, and, the, and the point of this story is because it's all about God. It's nothing about Jonah. But Jonah has a prayer. That's interesting because this was the part that Jesus quoted here. He says, it's the Son of Man is in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. That's the sign to you. Well, chapter 2, that's the section that Jonah is in this sperm well at the depths. And the thing about sperm wells, is they dive extremely. Of all the wells out there, they dive the deepest. So they're, it, this well is going to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. So let, we're going to pick up and we're going to read Jonah's prayer. And what's also amazing about Jonah's prayer is Jonah claims the answer to the prayer. The provision came from God before it actually occurred. He knew, okay, God, you got me now. Okay, I thought I was going to die, but now I'm stuck inside of a well at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, and something is going to occur. 
the Lord got a hold of Jonah. And Jonah at this point realized there's no way of getting away from preaching to the, Ninevi- the men of Nineveh, the Ninevites. Do you know, it's kind of like, have you ever heard the phrase, you get what you pay for? You, if you buy junk and cheap stuff, it, it, that's really what you get. And Jonah, in many ways, is about to get what he paid for. You run from God, you're carrying a big weight, and you find yourself in the middle of the sea. <clears throat> I was not actually going to wear this blue shirt. About a month or so ago, our iron at our house broke. Any other men here iron? Oh, co- oh come on. I said, I'm not going to call you out one other. One other hand went up. Goodness, okay. I thought for sure I could. Anyway, our iron broke. And I sent Junior to Walmart to buy iron. Now, I said, Junior, you go to Walmart, and I want you to buy the cheapest iron they have. So you just get something. I'm just, I only iron a few times a week, uh, so, or not, even, not that much sometimes. So you just get something very expensive. So he comes back with the cheapest iron. I think it was $14.99. And it's by a company, and you all will know this if you've ever bought a, any type of product by Hamilton Beach. You get what you pay for when you buy Hamilton Beach at Walmart. So I get this iron. This is the worst iron I've ever seen. It's the cheapest one they sell. It actually won't even stay upright. It will fall over and just catch your house on fire. And it's so cheap, it doesn't have one of the shut-off valves. So if it falls over or something happens, uh, it, um, if a cat jumps up on it, it will uh, click itself. Oh, no, it just burn everything down. It's just, it's just like you're really holding this little cheap piece of metal and uh, and, uh, electricity in your hand, and it got way too hot. So uh, you're ironing, and go, this is awful. Even my mother tried it, and she realized, Daniel, you need a new iron. This is just not a good good iron. So this week, I was ironing a white shirt, and I pick up this cheap $14.99 iron. This nasty brown and black water spewed all over this shirt. Oh, Oh, my goodness. I was so mad, I threw the thing in the garbage. I mean, it was just, it was junk. Garbage. And I thought, that is what, you get what you pay for. That is what Jonah is getting right here. You go, you run from the Lord, here you find yourself among seaweed and goo all over you, just nasty stuff. All over you. And here we go, verse 17, the Lord appointed a great fish. The Bible does not say it was a well to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish. Look at this. Three days and three nights. Jesus quoted that verse. Now look at this. Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of his fish. This prayer a lot of times, what's powerful about this prayer is Jonah recognizes the answer before he even gets out of of the fish. He knew If I obey the Lord, this fish will set me free. I know if I commit to the Lord to obey what He's asked me to do, then I'm going to go free. He he claims the answer while he's still in the fish. And understand, for us, we know if we obey the Lord and we do what He's asked, and we, we do what he's asking us to do, we follow his Lord, he's going to see us through. So this is, might be for some of you here, you're in the midst of, of a fish. You're just in a difficult time. It might be in your family, in your marriage, in your finances. And God's calling you. He's saying, if you do this, the answer will come. The provision will happen. So look at this prayer. Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. I called to the Lord in my distress. And he answered me. He got two answers right there. One, a fish came and saved him. Two, he's going to be set free. He recognizes, if I am stuck in this well at the bottom of the sea, I guess I, God has a plan for me. Like, this is just, going, I'm, I'm coming out. I cried for help from deep inside Sheol. You heard my voice. When you threw me into the depths of the heart of the seas, the current overcame me. All your breakers and your billows swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight. Now look at verse 4. Look at the latter part of this verse. Yet I will once more look 
towards your holy temple. That's the temple in Jerusalem. Jonah was about to die. He thought his tomb was going to be the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. And now all of a sudden, he had to know. He gets swallowed by a well, and he's still alive, and there's oxygen inside the well, and you're there, and you're realizing it's not over. And God is getting a hold of him inside of this fish. And he's recognizing, right now I've been banished from your sight, but I know, Lord, based on the circumstances of what you've done to me, I will be going back to Jerusalem. I will be seeing your temple once more. As I walk to Nineveh, I will pass right by that temple, and I will look up, and it will remind me of this answered prayer. That's what verse 4 is saying. The water engulfed me to the neck of the watery depths overcame me. Seaweed and wrapped around my head. You all know, I've, I've been preaching over 20 years, and never in my life has this happened. I have gum. I just stepped on gum. Someone, someone put gum up here on the pulpit, and it's on the bottom of my shoe. I mean, it just fits along with the iron situation. It fits along with Jonah right here. I mean, this guy, he has seaweed all around him. I have gum on the bottom of my shoe. I feel it every single step I make right now. Just like Jonah, you wonder, who would spit gum in a pulpit? That must have happened last Sunday when nobody was here. I sank to the foundations of the mountains. The earth's gate shuts behind me forever. Then you raise your life from the pit, my Lord. He's recognizing, I am in the pits, but Lord, I'm coming out. he's He's giving us a story of our answer prayer. He says, you're in this terrible situation in life but lord there is hope as my life was fading away i remembered the lord and my prayer came to you to your holy temple he's calling it's like he's it's like he's knows god's going to hear my prayer god's going to answer this those who cherish worthless idols abandon their faithful love But as for me, I will sacrifice. What's amazing about this is those men, right at when Jonah was thrown aboard, they were making sacrifices because they were sad they killed a man. But the man's alive, and he's saying, I'm going to make a sacrifice again. Lord, I will get a chance, a second chance. And see, the story of Jonah is God of a second chance. And some of you, you are receiving, or you are in need of a second chance. And This man here is recognizing when I get out of this sea, when I get out of this great fish, I will joyfully go to the temple, to the Lord. I will make my sacrifice to God. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Salvation belongs to the Lord. When he makes that statement, I will fulfill what I have vowed, he's saying, God, you got me. You got me. I'm in this situation, and it's miserable, it's terrible, but this is a true miracle. And look what happens in verse 10. It says, then the Lord commanded, notice the fish. The fish is, the the author of this whole story, the, the main character is God. He is just directing, he's directing the storm. He's directing the fish. This is how wonderful our God is. Nothing is by accident. Everything's under His control. The only person He's trying to redirect here is Jonah. Because Jonah is going the wrong way. He commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. I mean, what an awful picture. I mean, this man shows up on the banks of the Mediterranean Sea. Just, I mean, nasty. Nasty. Off, I mean, just pitiful situation. But he's alive, and that's all he's got. And it's time now to obey the Lord. And it says here in verse 3, now look at this. I'm going to read for or chapter 3. I'm going to read three verses here. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. A second time. First time he didn't obey. And we are a God, we have a God of second chances. And you have. Maybe you are, you are running like Jonah and you've been swallowed and God got you. And he says a second time, get up. Now this is on, I, th- I can just imagine this is on the banks of the Mediterranean. 
He's covered in seaweed. And God is he's just laying on the sand, alone, no one's around. And this is one of these great fish stories. Nobody's going to believe Jonah. Probably no one saw. He just shows up on the banks. And it's just, uh, he's, he's barely alive. And God says, get up, get off the ground, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach the message that I tell you. So even the message is from the Lord. Everything in this story is from the Lord. Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. Now, Nineveh was an extremely great city, a three-day walk. That meant three days. It was a large city, 120,000 people, a lot of lost people there. Jonah went to the city, and he preached, and the people repented. What would the barrier with Jonah would say, why did, why did Jonah disobey? Jonah disobeyed because in verse chapter 4, verse, um, latter part of verse 2, tells us why he did not want to go. It says in 4.2, I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. He says, God, I knew this was going to happen. Jonah hated the people so much in Nineveh, he just did not want them to be saved. And I want to tell you, this was a long, this was like a 1,500 mile journey. It was a long walk. Uh, Nineveh is in current day Mosul, Iraq. It's in northern Iraq. It was an area that got taken over by ISIS 10 years ago. And it, back seven, eight hundred years ago, when this story occurred, it was in, uh, deep in sin. And God is sending Jonah there to preach repentance. And he didn't want to do it. So you say, what prevented him from doing it? Well, I want to, illustrate, I want to read a story here. I'm going to read a quote out of a book. If you ever want to read a book about uh, the summary of the Christian life, there was a man about 80 years ago named C.S. Lewis, and he, it's called Mere Christianity. This is a story, or it's, a, it's basically a, um, a, a, a book that tell, teaches us what we should believe about the Christian faith. And C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity, on page 124 of his book, he talks about how pride is the greatest barrier that prevents us from obeying God. You say, what does this have to do with Jonah? Jonah did not feel like those people in Nineveh deserved the chance to get saved. Now understand the connect. He didn't want, if you remember chapter 4 verse 2 says, he's like, God, I knew this was going to happen. I knew if I went and preached, these people would get saved. But the irony of this whole story is who needed two chances to obey God? Jonah. He's the one that didn't obey God. The people of Nineveh were actually more responsive to God than Jonah was. Jonah had to go to Nineveh via a fish because of his disobedience. And that's what pride does to you. Jonah was blinded to the fact that he is just like the people of Nineveh. He's disobedient. He didn't want to obey. That's why Jesus says, you, Jonah had to go the depths of the earth three days and three nights. He came up out, and the men of Nineveh, they responded, and they will rise up and actually condemn our generation because the men of Nineveh are the example. We and Jonah are not the example. Jonah is an example of disobedience. The man did not obey the Lord. I mean, God totally had to perform a miracle of saving this man to get him a second chance. And what happened, pride prevents us from obeying the Lord. C.S. Lewis wrote, As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. You can't. Pride is a wall that prevents us from knowing the Lord. He says a proud man is always looking down on things. That's Jonah. He was looking down on the men of Nineveh. And people, of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. Meaning, you're not, when, you're, when you're looking down upon other people, when you're having a judgmental attitude and you're saying they don't deserve that, then you don't see the Lord. God did not see. Until Jonah got trapped in the fish at the bottom of the depths of the Mediterranean Sea, covered in seaweed, and realized that he couldn't even die, at that point, he finally repented and turned to the Lord. So tying all this together for us this morning, what does this have to do? with Jonah's story, it's actually a story of God's pursuit of us. 
God's pursuit, God called Jonah. He was called by the Lord. Then God saved Jonah. It wasn't Jonah didn't save himself. It was all the Lord. And on that, God gave Jonah a second chance. And for us spiritually, we see Jonah recognizes this when he was in the depths. And he actually recognized that God's provision, the answer to prayer, was actually going to come before it even came. He's, pray, he's thanking the Lord for the answer in verse 2, but the answer of prayer didn't actually come to verse 10. He knew, God, I know I'm sick. I know I've been disobedient. I know I have problems, but Lord, I want to thank you for answering and hearing my prayer. I want to thank you for giving me a second chance to go worship at the temple again. I want to thank you that I will be able to give my sacrifices to church, that I will be able to come and worship again in this, in this holy city is what he said. By disobeying God, Jonah brought about an unnecessary weight on his life, and he's sinking. When you're carrying the weight, you're just sinking. It gets harder and harder and harder. Until finally, the Lord intervened, and uh, salvation came. So, for us this morning, we look at this story of Jonah, and we say, God, I want to... Make sure when you tell me to go, when you are very clear to me in Scripture or through my prayer life, that I actually respond the first time. Jonah is an example of many ways of a failed prophet who just... You read chapter 4, the Bible says Jonah was not only was he angry that the people of Nineveh uh, repented, he he went up on top of a city. And he wanted to see God destroy all. He went up on top of a hill overlooking Nineveh. He wanted to see God destroy the city, like a Sodom and Gomorrah event. But then the people, because they turned to the Lord, he, they, God didn't do that. So then Jonah's complaining. God sends up this little a tree because Jonah was getting sunburned, and the tree gave him some shade. And then he was happy. But then the tree died, and it withered away. And he started to get sunburned again. And Jonah blamed the Lord. And then God got a hold of him and says, Jonah, look at your life. I saved you from the depths of the Mediterranean Sea. I gave you a second chance. You didn't want to see the people get saved, but I said I wanted them to get saved. You you were getting sunburned. I provided you a tree. And uh, then the tree died, and now you're complaining again. It's like, The story of Jonah's life is just one of ups and downs. And Jonah blamed, sadly, Jonah blamed God. And what's amazing about this, verse 10, this really puts in in touch with our priorities. Jonah was a selfish man. He didn't want to get sunburned. He didn't want to see people saved. He didn't even want to walk to Nineveh. He wanted to go the opposite way. In verse 10, I'm in chapter 4, verse 10. Last verse I'm going to read. And the Lord said to Jonah, You cared about the plant, which you did not labor over and did not grow. Now it appeared in a night and perished at night. So may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people, cannot distinguish their right and their left, as well as many animals. Meaning, Jonah, your priorities are wrong. All you care about is a plant. And you care about getting sunburned, but you don't have a passion for lost people. And God is speaking to us this morning that if we're not careful what pride does, being a proud man or a proud woman, you lose what the perspective of what God cares about. God cared about the people who didn't know from right from wrong. He wants to see people saved. And Jonah didn't want to see people saved, and he didn't want the plant to die. And we read that story, and this is the most bizarre way a story ends. It basically ends with God rebuking Jonah. And then Jesus quotes this prophet. He says, this is your sign right here. If you want to know about the Lord, go read the book of Jonah. He's the one to you know. So tying all this together, what do we do? God tells us to go. We say no, and if that happens, then God's going to say, whoa. And that's when we find ourselves in the depths of a fish, covered in seaweed, and the Lord has got a hold of us, 
And at that point, we have to repent. We turn to the Lord and says, Lord, I'm now ready to obey. God is a God of second chances. And if he's given you a second chance, he's given me a second chance, we never want to miss that opportunity. Jonah didn't miss it. I'm going to invite everyone to stand up. David, why don't we have our invitation? We're going to respond to the Lord. David and Steve are going to lead us in our song. <clears throat> many of you might be here and you have read this story many times, but God has opened up your eyes to say, do you know the, there are some things in this story that I see that I have been prideful, that I have uh, failed to respond to God the first time, and Lord, I just my priorities are wrong. If, if Jonah's most important priority is a plant rather than people, something is wrong. And we want to ask the Lord this morning as we respond to Him. says, God, I want to make sure that my eyes are open to doing and responding how you want, have called me to do. And that's first and foremost, if God tells us, instructs us to do, including getting saved, uh, joining a church, giving our lives to Jesus, we want to respond this morning in obedience. So we're going we're gonna to sing. Hymn number 465, Only Trust Him. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. For Jesus shed His precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you so much, David. I want to remind everybody, we do have Sunday school that starts in a couple of minutes, so you need to go to a Sunday school class. That is where you make friends and you get connected with that. Uh, tonight we have a special concert. Glenn Dawson will be here with Forgiven. So, and we, they have uh, the um, uh, ventriloquist. Lori will be here. Vivian will be singing. So it's going to be a special concert tonight. You want to come back to church? It's at six o'clock. Glenn, anything else? So invite your friends. It'll be a, a, a great time. Glenn's got the whole program, and uh, I know you'll really be blessed this evening for our concert. Bring our lost friends, absolutely. So Glenn will be sharing the gospel. It's a great opportunity to respond. So that's tonight, 6 o'clock for our evening worship. Remember, this week we're praying for revival, which is next week with that. So we'll have our guest preacher. Name above all names, let's sing. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, Glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Redeemer, living Word. Amen.